I'm live. I'm like, this is why I have a big computer set up with a like music playing at the beginning and stuff, which just goes over all of this. Yeah, because I don't have the mic drop intros that I used to have yeah. that worked well. So we don't even know if the audio is good though. We're gonna have to get yeah. people to tell us that. Well, you you just turn up the audio. I'm like, this is why I have a big computer set up. See, like it's music working. Playing at the beginning it is working, stuff, but we're kind of just kind of low in the frame. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Because I don't have the mic drop intros that I used to Let's have. Fix that. Well. Okay. We don't even well, know if well, you're not so high in the frame. Tell us that. Well, you, you just turn up the audio. This is why I have a big computer set up. The music playing at the beginning. Now, now, now you might not be fit. We're going to have to check. Let's see. Because I don't have the mic drop intros that I used to have. Oh, and now we're echoing here. I'm going to have to check you. Hold on. It doesn't matter. It's not like there's anybody here. Oh, you fit. See? Oh, we're all we're all fitting. Right, I'm gonna roll this down. We got 19 people watching. God, God love them. God love them. God love them. Never more appropriate response than that. God, God love, love you. Them. God love you. There we go. The audio's not bad considering we're working on a lav mic here. Yep. There we go. You better get that plugged in. Got to have a telly. Got it. Yeah. If you the Texas telly. Yes. The Texas model telly. There we go. There we go. And I've got this handheld here. Yeah. Uncle Left Eye's there. Steve Moore. Why did he not tell us? I'll explain that. <laughs> Tech, techno Wizard. That's me, huh? Lefty. Techno Wizard. That's pretty funny. I'm going to be looking down here. Uh, but you, you have to remember to look up, too. Uh, you're over there. People are yeah, over there. People but are I, there. I'm going to do, I'll be doing like, yeah. like that. Okay? There we go. Giving us a camera direction here. <laughs> a little to the left. And I'm getting yes. already, I'm getting, is that shirt made of denim? So the first <laughs> thing I said to Zach when I actually was in the same space as him in the universe was um, I appreciate that he didn't turn the heat down here in Nashville for my visit, that he gave me yeah. the full experience. It is about, this is my summer uniform shirt. This is, I've, I own three of these. You know, like I have three of those denim shirts I own. Okay, I might have more of those, but I have three of these linen summer indigo shirts as well I, you, I know you didn't ask you're not asking people but you're gonna get that's what you get it says we should move the camera to the right i don't know i think the framing's pretty good you know yeah, it's fine we, it, we, we get, do this for a living you know well and, and keith keith <laughs> needs more room because he he moves his hands around more because he, he's just more he communicates with his hands because i grew up in an all italian town yeah <laughs> right and on, what's the matter you yeah oh no look fast is on from uh rome oh my god it's all the standard culprits here. Usual suspects, I think, is the expression I'm looking for. Yeah. So, you know, I actually did pack the denim shirt. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then I went down to bring things to the car and then I just left this on. It's, 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 I like it. It's it's it, very becoming. It. Thank you. Yes. It's about a 90 degree, 90 humidity kind of rig we got going here. You know, we call that a handsome top. It's got a handsome, a handsome top. Yeah. Yeah. We're not referring to an anatomy in that. No, 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 no. This is just no. about your it's a, shirt. It's, yeah. it's a politically correct universe now. Absolutely. Yeah. Now it's, it's uh, top is now, you know, it can, it's, it doesn't <laughs> matter what, you know, what you choose, you know, any, you know, what was called a shirt can now just be called a top. And okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Like on a, like on a convertible. That's right. Because it is convertible, I guess. Yeah. 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 You can take it not yeah. on the show. Right. Not, we're not taking <laughs> stuff off on the show. Not never, at all. Never, never no. do. I am in the heart of ask Zachdom yeah. here. Uh, it's it's like I it's, it's kind of like I know everybody in the room. I know that Stapleton amp. The the box amp is a little bigger than I expected to be, but oh my god, it sounds good. Um, I don't even know what that is. That a little Fender bass amp in the corner? Yes, I uh, you know my my son has been learning to play bass some, and uh, so we have a little Rumble uh, Fender amp that uh, uh, that Fender was uh, they they gave me a discount code. Uh, and, uh, nice. Uh, and I, I picked so your that son, up. You see, so your son has an artist deal. Yeah, <laughs> my my son, <laughs> my thirteen year old son, he has a Fender artist deal. That's actually a joke. No, yeah. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, and in, I, your, the, in your cream. Yeah, and I've got the Tone Master back there, and the yep. and the the Harvard. You know, all the all the all the gals are out, and uh, the, there we got you got guitars about the room. We'll come back to those. You know that that um, uh, Tone Master 
with the cream back and stuff the way I had the ones I had set up as well. The story I always tell about those. Did you tell the story about how you gigged with the Vox and the Tone Master? And um, did you tell that where? And then you went, you came back, and you told this. I, I don't, I don't know that I told it, but uh, yeah, there was a there was a gig that I played, uh, you know, last year where I'd taken the Tone Master and the Vox, and and we took a, you know, this was a casino show in Oklahoma, and we we took a break. And I think I, I think our food was finally ready that we had ordered three hours before, and we so everybody's finally, a little rattled. Yeah, everyone's a little rattled. We had we had eaten candy bars <laughs> <laughs> because oh, we were so hungry, and that's such, not a good idea. Such a good road story. Yeah, and you were running the Vox yes. liked, and the Tone Master running out of the XLR. Yes. to the front of house guy. Yes, and yeah. so we had to break. And we're eating our, our food that's now cold because it was ready right as we went on. Right. And then we get our food and we're, we're shoving it in our, in our faces. And then we go back on stage and I forget to turn no, no, no. the, you're, the you're, box back you're, on. You're, you're dropping the, you're dropping the punchline already. What? You played the whole second set. Yes, I did. He plays the whole second set. Yes. And then he's, and he's, he's feeling good about the tone. It's a great gig. Everybody's yeah. happy. They got some food in their belly finally. Yeah. And he goes over to turn the box off and he never turned it back on. That's, that is actually what, what happened. Yes. Yeah. I, I, uh, and I tell know. that story about the tone master. Cause to me that says, all you kind of need to know about how happy you are with that tone yeah, master. It's it's a it's such a great amp and, and I think the the attenuator is one of the the just the greatest features of it. If one it's light, but two the attenuator, it means that you can turn the thing up to five or six, whatever you know the sweet spot is for you. And for me, it's five. And so if I can turn an amp up to five, and then I can bring it down to the volume I want it to be, or even turn the speaker off if they don't want stage volume, you know that high. Still, that's that's really nice to be able to get the the sound that you want at whatever volume. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, some guys will will give them a hard time, you know, because it's not tube or whatever. But at the end of the day, all that matters is it sounds good, and it's just so nice to. Sometimes you know you can run into engineers that are not really good at micing stuff up, yeah. and so it's nice to have something that's idiot proof, where it's like you just plug an XLR into the back of that, and you're going to have a sound that's right here in your face, and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the IR on that version, and you can you can install it yourself on the black one as well. Um, is the speaker that's in it? It's a cream yeah. back, so you're sending yeah. what was IR'd in a room with a cream back yeah. out to the desk. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So yeah. I'm in charge. I'm in charge of the comments. Yeah. Uh, so so you but, read some read some comments. What or, we got here already? Yeah. Greetings from Philly, Bob Decat. Hey, Bob. Uh, there's there's people on here. Steve Moore, of course. We can't really complain about the weather where Steve is. It's probably just a wee bit warmer. I was, it was Steve that was giving us camera advice. Thanks, Steve. He probably still thinks we need to move it over. But. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> he wants to know where your denim shirt is. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's in my uh, closet. <laughs> this is so. not, this is I'm out of uniform. Yeah. I should be wearing like an Ask Zach. It's a sickness. <laughs> Yeah. T-shirt. That's, I'm this is not my merch. party. I'm on vacation. He's at work right here. I'm wearing my merch. There you go. All right. So, so yes, while you're thinking about it. There you go. That's a se <laughs> segue. We're, we're professionals. Well, there you go. I'm thinking about it. Yeah. So this is, of course, the AMP schematic shirt that you maybe you can see at the bottom of your screen, you know, via Teespring or what have you. But uh, I do appreciate everyone that has uh, supported me. And, of course, uh Keith also has a Patreon page and wonderful merch, and I have uh, you know, a piece of his merch. I, I don't think I've ever sent you an Ask Zach shirt, which yeah, would be the proper thing to do. I don't, I don't really wear a lot of t-shirts with, okay. with print on them. Yeah. I, I actually owned, uh, I bought a guitar. I bought two guitars in two months, which for me is a general test of my mental ill health yeah. if I'm buying up guitars. And so I actually ordered myself a sample of the Enough t-shirt. Yeah. And I, I put it on, it's purple, so it's shocking to my system. And I put it on on Sundays and I look in the mirror and it says enough, just enough, you know, that's yeah. all it says. That's good, that's good. So that's the closest, and I, have a, I have, and I actually have a video that I'm thinking of doing um, about the PRS Modern Eagle 5 that I got, but it's like a black, really beautiful black burst. Um, and it's black, and I'm like, hmm, I kind of need a black denim shirt for this. Yeah. So I ordered a black yeah. denim shirt, and then I ordered a black, Whoa. what they call a minimalist t-shirt, uh, yeah. t-shirt which just says five Watt world in tiny little print. You know, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you people are enthralled by this. So, yes. so one, 
I, I've never met, we would never met in person until this morning. We, yeah, and we've, we've had tons of phone calls and, uh, and Zooms and FaceTimes and, yeah. uh, and years. Yeah, for, years for and years. years. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll just tell the story, you know, quickly. Uh, one, I'm very grateful for, for Keith's, you know, friendship and also his mentorship and, and just how much he helped me when starting my channel. And I always feel so old when you yeah. go into this. When no, you say well, you mentorship. Shouldn't. Okay, well, just friendship. <laughs> just your friendship and help. And so it, it meant, I'm just you know, it meant so, you know, so much to me. Because I had been doing the True Tone Lounge, and of course, which is, you know, when you're hosting, you know, kind of an interview thing, and really your job is to keep the guest talking, that's one thing. And then all of a sudden, when you're the focus of it, and also you're starting something, you know, on your own. This, you know, of course, Ask Zach is not being funded by True Tone. And so all of a sudden I had to do everything myself and I was making all these decisions and it, it can be easy, you know, for me or maybe others to get a little overwhelmed. And so Keith had reached out because he had wanted to use some footage yep, from, from the, it, right. the True Tone Lounge. I think maybe of some pedal boards, some like small pedal boards. Yeah, stuff. I don't think I've ever, I never have made that. I have about yeah. a half a script about, uh, what was it, like lessons I learned about small pedal boards from True Tone Lounge. Yeah. I was going to go, I have notes about like different episodes, the Guthrie yeah. Trap one, even the David Grissom one, like yeah. where you look at how much mileage they get out of so few pedals. Right. Yeah. That's why I reached out. It was years ago. And, you know, of course he, you know, he didn't do it, which I'm still, yeah, not yet. I'm still hurt we'll do it. <laughs> about, but no. <laughs> I'm sure you'll but, recover. So, so when, uh, when I finally, you know, got, uh, you know, uh, you know, ruffled up enough or, or whatever the word is to, uh, to finally do something on my own, you know, I really depended on uh, a lot of, a lot of help from, from a lot of advice from, from Keith and Keith was someone that got me started doing merch and, and taught me the importance of thumbnails and titles and all these things. Yeah. And we're so, still learning it. Yeah. We're learning and it, it, it is. It's, it's a, and you know, there's always things that are changing. You know, the, you have, you know, we had this time period where everyone was kind of stuck at home and then all of a sudden you don't and it, and it's, things are always shifting and that's, yeah. the, you can never really get overly uh, comfortable. Right. And you, because you've right, always right. got to be, right. uh, you know, on your toes with how things are shifting. Right, right. So we spent a bunch of time, I got to play the 57 Esquire. It's an amazing guitar. It's everything I imagined it is, would be, whatever, talked about pickups, etc., which has all been so well documented on the channel um it's just it's i have to tell you it's 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 a lot prettier in person than it is on camera it's mm. just the right amount of wear and the neck is glorious although i will tell you that it's very similar in zach says that they built it on it um i had a telly that i built out of a uh, fender baja neck uh that v-shaped neck that they had and man that's very close it yeah. is very close to this neck so yeah, so this if you have a, a Baja Tele, you have a neck that feels very similar to this. Yeah, well, this you just need to play it for 30 years and it'll feel similar yeah. to that. Yeah, and, and get some of this, you yeah. know. Or the work. back even. Yeah, the, the back is a lot of fun. <laughs> even the back of the neck has got a lot of goodness to it. Yeah. It's very good. But you know, I one of the reasons I wanted to come here was to do this. <laughs> I mean, what's more fun than having Zach Child play my Strandberg Esquire. I mean, it's just, it's an Esquire like any other. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same, same. And now this is, that's not, this isn't the first reveal moment. He actually has played it already this morning um, to get a taste. It's got sound. It's got sound. <laughs> We got top chat. Hold up, we got top chat. Uh, Steve Moore says uh, he got two Five Wild World T-shirts recently. Wants to know how he gets an amp schematic T-shirt. You would get that at. Well, you can go to askzach.com. There you go. Yeah. Thanks for the, the segue. Store. There Thank you go. You. Yeah. And this is a deluxe schematic. Yes. But it's not the original. You had somebody draw this for you, right? Yeah. And so yeah, they had to to do a little uh, you know fixing on it and make it you know kind of fit. Yeah. And so uh, the same designer that did the pick guard for my Esquire and did my logo. Uh, his name is Jay Smith. He has a company called Juice Box Designs here in Nashville. Does a lot of, uh, he's done a lot of album covers and uh, and book covers and things like that. And he's a good longtime friend and a, and a guitar collector and player. 
and uh, so he, you know, was just the right person to do so. That's know, great. know that the the people that uh, that have designed stuff for me, they are hardcore, you know, eat up with it guitar players also. So. And then Uncle Left Eye says he's waiting to see that True Tone pedal board episode. The tr- yes, yeah. he's, you're, he, you're, Uncle Left yeah. is just jumping right in and saying we got to have that episode after all. The slanted frets, they got me. So I I didn't get the harmonics on that. So the thing that I always expect people to react to uh, is the next shape on the back. And Zach immediately said he liked the next shape. And the way you play with your thumb over, it ends up just being a nice hand filling kind of shape, which I've always thought is true. And it actually, I find myself, even when I'm reaching around to stretch for a chord or something, it just leaves my thumb in the right spot. Um, I think it's it's a really cool instrument. I, I do. I love the uh, the neck shape. It's kind of like this. Uh, it's kind of got a flat. Well, I can spot show it thing. actually on the other guitar. So let me do yeah. that because I've got my. Um, you can just throw that on the floor. Don't <laughs> don't literally throw it down, but yeah. I got that. So uh, these are both about two th- 2017 to 2019 when they still were baking the necks. It's got two stripes of graphite in here, and so they've stopped baking the necks because it just wasn't necessary and. Ole actually thought there was a difference in tone. It's a pretty bright guitar already with stainless steel frets, and we'll talk about where yeah. I've got that set up. But you can see there's actually three, three planes on here, and it's asymmetrical, and it's built so that your thumb is moving as you go up the neck more down and behind, as it as it does. You know, as you move up the neck, yeah. you're doing one of these numbers. Um, this is actually a, a Salen, which is their Tele style guitar that I had set up. Uh, in ice blue, like uh, John Corey uh, from uh, from Essex, England, uh, and this actually has K line pickups in it, and it, it's like the nicest hardtail strat. And I've never owned another hardtail strat, but it's the nicest strat tone I've ever had. We'll plug this in in a little bit. Nice. So, um, yeah. so, the, so the fan frets are an adjustment. They are an adjustment, and so and then just the 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 way it you know the way it hangs and everything is is. Is an adjustment, but it is you know extremely comfortable to play. I think it's just you know, it's just getting used to that. <laughs> David Barber wants to chime in, and he said, "This is just the sort of professionalism I've come to expect from myself." He says, <laughs> "Thanks, David." Uh, Sean Flint says, "This is the world's colliding moment." Hello from Scranton, PA. I'm gonna go right by you, Sean, on the way home. So. And Sean Alaco, all the way from Slovakia, man. That's great. Yeah, Sean, uh, that's, this has been something that's been in the works for so long. It was just, it was just a 13-hour drive away. I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. Yeah, I you know, really wanted to, uh, to meet Keith. And, and so we, you know, Keith is the one that, that made it happen. And I just, you know, I I'm said, on vacation. And I said, you know, whenever, whenever we can you know, do this, I will, I will do whatever it He did. Takes. He shifted his schedule around. The reason I actually, I would have done a meetup in town for five watt worlders but when i got here i actually ended up having a fever for about three days and was contagious for 24 hours after that so what would have been a nice leisurely four or five days ends up being packed into about a day and a half tomorrow i get in the car and i drive to atlanta to do some work with rick yeah um and so uh and visit with rat and other dave honorado other folks that i know yeah. there the uh, beato the the yeah the good people of atlanta so. yes um <laughs> deja vu uh, Deja Voodoo wants to know if there's room for a B, B bender in that. Well, a B bender would be quite something with that weird bridge. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that, you know. I think you would have to have a a, a, a Telecaster type bridge on there to put a, a bender on there. But you know, Joe Glazer is so crazy that I mean, <laughs> he would probably take on the challenge and and figure out how to do it. I've talked to Ola about um, what material the actual bridges saddles are made out of. 
because they're very, very light. And these actually to, are highly adjustable. They just unscrew and screw in. And I think they're um, they're stainless, but they're tiny. And I asked him if he yeah. ever did a set with brass, um, just for grins. And um, so it's a pretty bright guitar. It's an ash guitar with a roasted maple neck and stainless frets. And I remember back when I got it, because I immediately it was very, it's a very um, resonant guitar. Um, and I asked Zach, I wanted to put a single pickup, got a custom fret, um, pick guard for it. And I wanted a quiet pickup because I wanted to experiment with a single pickup guitar. And um, and you pointed me at the videos that Jeff Sen made about Mojo Tones pickups. And you said that Jeff, Jeff's yeah. a local builder here in town, uh, very storied builder here. Yeah, and Dan Strain uses them. Oh, Dan as well. Yeah. So oh, no kidding. He, he wow. He uses them when, uh, you know, because many t it's the pros many times that, that ask for that because, you know, depending on the gig, you know, sometimes guys, you know, pros will order two two Jeff Sins or two Dano casters, one with single coil pickups and one with hum canceling ones so that they can go out on the road. And if it's just a bad arena or venue that they're at, you know, they can play the one with, with, you know, the mojos. Yeah. In there. yeah. Yeah. And I've actually thought repeatedly about putting, uh, getting a different pick guard. And I actually have a, a pair of those mojo tone pickups and putting one in the neck and then I'll play it and I'll, I'll play it in a minute. But the, um, the reality is that you just get so many great tones out of the yeah, bridge. There's a, a lot of great tones out of it. And, and, just... and I've been very lazy about really putting real Esquire wiring in it. It's just slapped together where it really only has one usable yeah. position at this point. There you go. Yeah, the front position doesn't work. That's the same. Yeah, yep. and then you have two yep. positions that are the same. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, really fun, fun instruments. Well, and around the time I was doing this was when Julian Lodge was out on the road playing uh, uh, an old telly and um, and a champ. And uh, and I'd read a couple of places that, depending on the night and the space, he'd played whole shows. This is a jazz guy. He'd playing whole shows on the bridge with the tone rolled off. Yeah. Just to get the level of definition he wanted in the room. And, and I play it like that all the time. So, very cool. Very, very cool. You got any... Fun comments. No, I really left. Everybody left. All right. <laughs> we, we, well, it was good to see you guys. It's nice of since we dropped in. So uh, so long. Brent Johnson well. says hello, Zach. Have you had a chance to record at Addiction Studio in Nashville? I have. Thanks to I, both of you for content. Yeah, I, I don't know that studio. I'm sure it's somebody fam someone's I, I, famous. Someone's famous studio. I, I don't. You know, I don't get around as much as I probably ought to. I'm, and Tom Tom Rutler says hi from Winthrop Harbor. Is that nearby? No, uh, but uh, Tom, Tom's a, a great uh, fingerstyle player and, and player otherwise. And oh, so, okay. Uh, and, and, he, uh, and he has a uh, deluxe reverb and a Vox AC-15. There you so, go. You know. That's like me good. knowing somebody's dog's name and not their name. It's like I tell the, <laughs> no, I did, tell I, the guys I did know his name too, but yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's great. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe the stream's not running now because we're frozen there. Yeah, it does look a little. Oh, maybe because I I told it to stop playing. Let's see here. Now we're yeah, so no. we are still going. Yeah, we're going. Yeah. I'm Unfortunately, just, we're still running. I'm just double checking here. Now we're going. Oh, good. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Christopher Nyman says that I'm the Marie Kondo of guitar world. Well, I'm I'm neither as petite nor as cute probably as Marie Kondo, but well maybe uh, maybe both. Know. I don't, I don't know who that is, even. <laughs> <laughs> who is that? <laughs> the woman that wrote uh, the book, um, The Magic Art of Tidying Up, or the... Um, I, I never get the title right. It, it's a book about um, minimalism and kind of moving towards only having things that really matter. Uh, the, she has a Netflix show. She's originally from Japan, but her, her name is Marie because her family was Catholic. And um, so she grew up Christian in a... In a a Buddhist Shinto world, and um, and she's I guess ever since she was a kid, she was obsessed with tidying up and cleaning things up. Yeah, and uh, she eventually leveraged that obsession into a career. Um, the her book, it's interesting. You know, <laughs> her book will actually get drilled down, and she gets kind of teased about like to tell you how to you know fold your socks and everything. But there's a thing in the book that haunts me, and and it actually is very five watt world. Uh, which is, um, she says, you sh before you start deciding what to get rid of, you should close your eyes and imagine your life, your ideal life, 
in as much detail as you can. Literally, like, just think your way through a day and think, well, if my life was the way I really want it to be, what would that look like? And she contends that if you are able to imagine your ideal life with enough detail, it will tell you what you need to own. Wow. I, I think that's a profound, fascinating, and yet to be proven fact in my life, I could tell yeah. you that. But but you don't you actually don't have a lot of gear. When I think of like the number of years you've been playing and 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 you said, you know, we have your your cap neck. Is that sixty seven? Yeah. We have your sixty seven telly out. You you were saying that um that that one kind of doesn't come out of the case so much now that the Esquire is here. Yeah, this is this is a, a great guitar that actually sounds very similar. I even did a video where I kind of compared the two, and the sounds between the two are, are just nearly identical. Uh, the The difference really is is in the feel of the neck. The the I prefer the V neck to the rounded, you know, kind of smaller neck that's on the sixty seven, and so they just it doesn't get played as much, but. You know, it just has a lot of sentimental value. And then, you know, Reggie Young side signed the uh, the back of the headstock when I interviewed him. And so, uh, you know, and, and it's still, it's a it's a great guitar, but it doesn't, it doesn't get played as much. And you can see how, you know, it's wonderfully uh, yellowed. And uh, yeah. I'm always amazed at, you know, every time I look at it, it's like, has it gotten more yellowed? <laughs> <laughs> Probably has. Um, yeah, I want to come back to that, actually, because there's something... Uh, Ivan Romenko from um, from Montreal says hi. Somebody asks, uh, Minty Green wants to know if either of us have experimented with Charlie Christian style pickups. I assume he means in our tellies. Yeah, I have not. I've, you know, it's just in the past, I think the uh, people were making true copies of them, which had the, you know, all of the the mechanism and, and such where you really had to rat out a lot of wood. And so I just, mm. I never went to it. And I think I, I just really, I really liked the tradition, traditional Telecaster thing, and I did experiment with some other, you know, neck pickups. Uh, specifically, I did the the neck mini humbucker for a while, and I just kind of came back to I really like a good regular Telecaster neck pickup. I mean, I yeah, I, I think it's you know it's a it's a good sounding pickup, and I think even the the early ones that have the brass cover instead of a nickel silver cover. They have kind of a nice mid-range quality to them, even though they are kind of somewhat dark. Hmm. So uh, we got uh, Jeff McElane and Angus Clark in the house from Dang. from Brooklyn. Wow, uh, these guys are probably sitting together in some deli up there drinking coffee, and they've got their phones out. Um, yeah, Tim, I was going to say. So there's two places I would steer you if you want to hear and listen to people talk about. <laughs> here we go. Uh, people talk about. Christian, Charlie Christian pickups and Telecasters. One would be Jason Lachlan's channel because Jason's been playing that Tele configured that way for a long time. Yeah. And then um, and then Tim, I mean, Tim at Tim one time, Lurch. Tim Lurch had uh, a Tele, might even still do, have a Tele set up with three yes. Charlie Christian pickups. Yeah. Yeah. He, he might have a problem. He, he might. <laughs> he might so, he quickly admit to that probably. So because you know we have we have Keith here, I can I can go into my you know my closet of doom, and I can pull stuff out of the out of the junk. Well, it's not even junk. So this is a uh, this is an actual uh, sixty six pick guard that I bought off of uh, eBay because and it was cheap because it had already been routed for a mini humbucker, and then I got this seventy two uh, mini humbucker and stuck it in there. So this has been in. Uh, you know, one probably my, my old black telly with the Dano caster neck that was sitting there for a while, and and before that, and you can see how old this pit guard is. This is actually a '90s uh, WD pit guard, and look, I mean, look at the color it's turned. I mean, that's like, that's amazing. It, it started out mint green, so you can see what color yeah, it started, yeah, yeah. and it was even brighter than that. And so I did the Brent Mason setup for a long time in the 90s because Brent Mason was kind of like the god. Yeah. And uh, and if you wanted to play and cover all those sounds, it was one of those things where you felt like you had to have the mini humbucker and the strap pickup in the middle and the telly bridge pickup and a B-bender. So I did that. And then this is just for, for giggles. This is the original pit <laughs> guard for my 57 Esquire. And it had been I was going to say, you got to show it from the side. Yeah. So it, if, if you can see, it is like, it is so horribly warped. 
And what happened was, is that someone had, it was thin to begin with, and then somebody painted it uh, red and then yellow. And you can see that where they, they tried, the, uh, the shop down in Tuscaloosa where I bought it from, they did everything they could to try to get the paint off, but they couldn't get it all. And then uh, Dan Strain tried to help me get more of the paint off, but it just kept getting thinner and more warped. So, I mean, it was very warped to be yeah, it looks with. like a piece of paper now. Yeah, yeah, it's so thin. And so uh, this is just kind of there for posterity. It's it, it's not, you know, usable at all. Yeah, right. But it's, uh, you know. So it's what, I, what did I break here? I got no tone. Oh, I don't have this working. There you go. There we go. Uh, we got some questions to save you from my guitar playing here. Um, Ivan wants to know, um, from Montreal, wants to know uh, suggestions for good tele neck pickups. I hate the darkness of a Squire Affinity tele neck pickup. I know it's ceramic, but it's too dark for me. So we already actually talked a little bit about this earlier, but I was saying to Zach, I was teasing him actually, because his Esquire is not currently in, and I'm going to, I call it the Zach Childs wiring, but I don't know where that wiring started. I, I well, don't let me know tell where... you what it is. Okay. So that's where you wire the neck pickup out of the tone circuit, take the tone off the neck pickup. So the neck is going straight and then you dial the amp. The idea is you dial your amplifier for that neck pickup to get the clarity you want, etc. And then you've got the tone on the bridge and you can then dial probably too bright now for your bridge. You use the tone on your guitar yeah. to modify the tone of the bridge to make it match. I'm so swept away by this idea that I actually have a, a PRS DGT, that wood library that I got from Ish Guitars. Um, amazing guitar, beautiful pickups. The, the guitar was built just last year. And um, and I have that wired where the neck, because it's just, you know, it's volume, volume, tone. Um, I have it wired like, the, like a Zach Child's Tele, where the yeah. neck pickup is direct, no tone on it. And I dial the amp for it. And then I use the tone to modify the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it works great. So I, I always think I, that's my first beginning when people start talking about how the telling net pickup is too dark. I'm like, that's the beginning. That, that Take is, it from there. That's the, that's the beginning. And so I don't know where it came from. I just know that I wanted it. And so then I had to figure out how to do it. And then I posted a schematic on my website. So if you want a, a wiring diagram, go to askzack.com. Oh, right. And then under like, I think it's under articles. So if you look under articles, you'll find a wiring diagram. And so I started doing it on all my tellies. And so this is my 67 telly and I, I wired it that way. So it's the, the tone controls only on the bridge. And I find that you can fix most pickups that way. Cause I don't care how dark the pickup is when you're able to dial in your amp while you're on the neck pickup. And then when you go to the bridge, you can just darken it. And it, I've you know never found it to where there were some pick, but if the pickup is just horrible and you're still having trouble, then Fender makes a uh, 64 pure vintage neck pickup that's hmm. under $100 and it has an actual nickel silver cover. So part of the thing with darkness is brass covers are going to be darker than nickel silver. Nickel silver will be brighter as far as, you know, as far as the cover. And so the the 60 the pure vintage especially if you can find a used one that is probably the cheapest but well wound and well done pickup that you can find out there. You know, I mean, you can you can pay more money and get other pickups like that. But if you're trying to get a, another neck pickup, kind of on the uh, on that's more budget friendly, because sometimes you can get those pickups for like sixty bucks used or something like that, or a whole set for a hundred bucks. And and it so. could be that you really don't love even a nice clear telly neck pickup, and they can go twisted telly, which is really a strap voiced Telecaster neck pickup. Right. And then you're going to get a little, it's a little more of a mid-range scoop. Yes. You, you'd you say get, you're going to get and, more like what I'm getting my, with my K-line here, which is... Part of what, what it makes makes it sound uh, brighter and such is the fact that it's scooped in the mid-range. And so you don't have that mid-range there. And so you hear right. the highs and lows more. And so, yeah, so there's a, the Twisted Telly and there's other manufacturers that make different versions of that. And that's sometimes different wire but m most of the time they have longer magnets right and they have the oh. magnets stick through the bottom also ah, okay. and usually they'll have a nickel silver cover also okay just to try to make it as bright as possible cool it's very cool i hope that was helpful uh <laughs> john wants to know john from ohio wants to know why the hell I didn't get notified about this? Because we didn't know. Yeah, this this just happened. This was <laughs> this was something where we, we tried to plan for this, but uh, 
as Keith mentioned before, he, he got a little bit under the weather and then it was something to where, okay, now we can get together and l let's do it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, we were literally talking guitars and Zach started pulling stuff out to go live, yeah. which we knew what we were going to do all day. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> is Zach huger or is Keith just tiny? Neither one. I'm probably sitting back a little, a well, little too far. We were talking, we were joking, Zach's like, you, you always talk about how you're small and you like small guitars. You're not small. I'm like, well, I'm like 5'10", buck 50, you know? So, anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I probably eat a little too much barbecue, so, uh, you know, or Thai <laughs> food. You know, those, my, yeah, I love duck. Oh, I love duck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, we're already talking about lunch now. Yeah. So, so, so this is this, uh, pick, the K-Line pickups. Chris, I told Chris about this project. He thought he was very excited about the project. All the electronics in this guitar actually are from Chris at K-Line. Um, he winds his own pickups. This is a, um, uh, a Strat set. It's someplace between a, like a 59 and 60 um, with a little hotter bridge, just a little bit hotter bridge. Oh, it's interesting though, um, if you can see it. Uh, I had to bring the bridge pickup up to balance with the others. It's interesting. And he wound that bridge pickup to to be more strat like so this is i mean i've got i've got the esquire over there so um and i i just think this thing sounds amazing this is uh I don't, not, not much output <laughs> we're playing it through the reverb um vibrachamp reverb follows John Cordy knows that this is John's uh, chord lesson from Friday. Beautiful. I think he called this uh, great chords for a strat. Like this is a man running out of titles. He makes videos every day. Yes. I great chords for a strap. Yeah, for a strap. Yeah, you're, you're running out of titles. <laughs> well, he knew it. He's, yeah. John is nothing if not tongue-in-cheek at all yeah. times. My favorite is when you move from this A major to the diminished and then stretch it up to the minor 7. That's it. I actually don't love where he goes from there. I've been trying to change. Guys will work on that for me anyway um where's the k-line tribute keith this is a k-line tribute um this is this is my k-line project the k-line um pickups in a strandberg which is the guitars i play all the time um and i have all kinds of pressure <laughs> from people like my script editor perry not so much from john i think john cordy is fine cornering the market on uh used springfield k-line guitars i <laughs> I've lost track of how many he has. He actually found one recently that weighs about seven and a quarter pounds, and he justified it as a great gigging guitar. Yes. Yeah, because yes. I think he has six other ones. Yeah. So, but so he's also made a lot of really good videos about um, getting rid of gear. He he started making videos when he had sold off twenty thousand pounds worth of stuff. This is before he got married last year. And then he made a video about thirty thousand, and now recently he's kept selling stuff at forty thousand pounds. So. It's pretty impressive. I can make no such. That's a lot of gear. I cannot make any such things. Uh, no. Got a hello from Lexington. Hello, Lexington. There you go. You're not that far away. Greetings for, from south of Dallas. Oh. There you go. So like, uh, not 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 all the way down to Waco though. Yeah. So. Skeleton Pete says he likes the Brad Paisley Esquire that has the stealth pickup in the neck. Yeah. Just to add a little extra beef to the blend, but doesn't impede the hot output of the bridge. You know, it's funny. I had a, a Japanese, crafted in Japan, early 90s, um, 62 custom Esquire. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the, the local guy and I said, is there a way we could put a neck and middle pickup under the pick guard? And he's like, ah, they'd be really far away. I don't think they, and we did it. It's not a great. Yeah, it's, it's a doable thing. Yeah, it's a very doable thing. It's just you have to have a high output, you know, right. pickups, and yep. you just you can't have a, a super thick pick guard. At least that doesn't that doesn't help things. Well, but, right, you're just yeah. trying to and any you had a hard time getting the level. You know, you just get it so close to the pick guard as you can. 
Yeah. That's what you got to do. So yeah. um, it was a very cool thing. Um, have either of you tried the Alfred mod on an Esquire to get that cocked wah sound? Oh, Sean Alaco wants to know that. Oh, it, it's uh, all it, it uh, Allred or what? What was his his name? Yeah, Eldred. 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 Uh, the Eldred. Mike mod. Eldred. Yeah, I have tried that before, and I, I just I thought it was a good. Uh, I thought it was an interesting sound, but there's just there have been a lot of different wiring things that just are interesting, but they don't uh, they don't really work for me in a in a in a live situation. I don't play enough um, enough situations where I'd want a cocked wah sound. And, uh, and yeah, so I have I to say that yeah. that sound, along with the um, the out of phase sound that like your buddy JD Simo makes work so well. Yeah, uh, I have trouble enough making the guitar not sound that thin. The only way <laughs> that out of phase works is if you're able to blend the pickups, because then you're able to blend the level of out of phase. Right. So, right. So JD is using it on a Gibson, which has two volume controls. So then he's able to control the amount of out of phase. And right. so he can make it have a little bit of that notched, you know, kind of nasal sound, but without it getting just so thin. And so someone has actually developed that for the Telecaster where it has a mini pot that's down in the control thing. So you have a phase thing. Huh. And that's actually in the in the Kenny Vaughn True Tone Lounge All that right. I did. He, he has that on his guitar and he talks about that. And I believe the contact information is in the description you, you of talk the, about of the video. Yeah. yeah. So we end up. So that is something that would appeal to me. But just again, like the the regular face switch on a Telecaster, I did that in the '80s or '90s because of Albert Lee. Albert Lee did the Starlix video in the '80s, and he had his old '52 Tele or '53, whatever year it was, and he. Uh, and he hits this, he has the only modification on the guitar was it had a face switch. And I was like, well, I got to do that. And he hit it at one point and it was like, and it sounded pretty thin, but he played like some really twangy chicken picking stuff and it was fine. And then I tried it on one of my guitars and I was like, this is terrible. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen the, uh, the Kenny Vaughn, that is not a player that I know a lot about. I, I like country music. I don't listen to it a lot, but so I kind of had not done that one. Um, but I watch all the True Tone stuff. I, I, that's how I found Zach in the first place. And um, the that Kenny Vaughn episode is fantastic. It's just really great. I highly recommend. And, it. and just you know to kind of help some of you guys kind of get over the hump as far as because a lot of y'all will think of Kenny Vaughn as a country guy, but he started out as both kind of he took lessons with Bill Frizzell and uh, and he also played in grew, a punk band. Grew, grew up, but grew up around yeah. in Denver and, and like. Johnny would go Smith. to Johnny Smith, the jazz guitar player's yeah. store. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> Just hang out at Johnny's and, store. And Kenny Vaughn, he played on one of the Pretenders records that came out in the last couple of years that was, I can't remember if it was T-Bone Burnett or who, or who produced it, but uh, you know, Kenny's a really extremely versatile guitar player. And so I think even, you know, I feel bad when people... I understand why people will sometimes pigeonhole him, but he's just, he's, you know, he's extremely well, I would, I'd go so far as to say, and I think this is actually an interesting, you know, video idea, batch of videos. I, I think this idea that um, all of us, the industry pitches us, that we should all be able to play all styles of music um, uh, is, is nonsense. Um, most of us, even if we were a full-time player, uh, to get your 10,000 hours of meaningful practice and all that kind of stuff, you really, you need to drill down in a single type of music. Um, Jeff McElwain said something on a stream recently um, that I thought was absolutely wonderful. He said, uh, his students sometimes will say to him, you know, yeah, but playing a 12 bar blues, you know, I get bored. He goes, if you're getting bored playing the 12 bar blues, you're not playing it right. Yeah. Like there should be a lot more going on yeah. for you. And I think that's true of every kind of music. Um, but this idea that we should be able to play everything. Having said that, because I think that is absolutely true, that's my opinion, but I think it is really true, there are a few guys who really can stretch over into different categories because really they've put in the hours in every category, and I think Kenny's one of those guys. He, you know? he is. There he, aren't many. Yeah. For, you know, I, I only, when, when I gig, you know, I gig mainly playing, you know, really kind of old school traditional country music because that's what I'm really comfortable doing. And it's like if somebody asked me to do something that's more contemporary where I'm going to need to use a lot of distortion and overdrive and a lot of power chords. It's just like, I'm not that guy. I'm the guy, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm, I'm not. And it's like, I, you know, I feel like a poser 
you know, and I don't feel, you know, and it's like, let somebody that loves that, you know, do that. Cause I mean, I don't, I don't hate it, but it's not what I want to play. I want to play, you know, clean ish most of the time and not with a lot of effects. And I, I don't want to be doing U2 stuff in a country song and, uh, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just, you know, I like to do, you know, my thing. And so, so that's, that's what, you know, that's what I do. And so sometimes, you know, I, I protect myself and, you know, the potential artist, you know, when they, when I'm asked to do something that's way out of my zone that I don't love, like it's one thing if it's different and I love it, but if it's different, I'm just like, I'm not that guy. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a moment in the David Grissom. I've watched that David Grissom interview a half a dozen times now. And, um, there's a point where he's got all of his gain stages on I and mean, it's just, it is just gunked up. And, um, and he says something to the effect of for all the moments when the producer wants that tone and you guys both just crack up. Yeah. Cause it's absolutely true, but it's that it, but the fact that you know where you are with it is great. Uh, Christopher Vincent says, that's pretty cool. How much does that Esquire cost? I don't, I don't think, I don't know what, which Esquire we're talking about. You're talking about my Strandberg. Um, I actually don't know current pricing on the, uh, I always call this my Esberg, my Eskberg, whatever you want. Um, I don't know what the, what the classics currently run. The pickups not expensive. The Mojo Tone pickups sound great, and they're not expensive, and they're dead quiet. Um, I can't imagine you'd be asking, Zach, the, the cost of his 57 Esquire. That's, that's like talking about the value of your children. I, you can't even do that. That's yeah, like, and, I, and that, that's, that's my forever guitar. Right? I mean, that's, that's like one of those things where it's like, I, you know, I was, I'm glad that in my lifetime I was able to you know, get a guitar that I love that, that has cured all of my longing for other Telecasters. It's like, I don't even think about other stuff. It's I, like, I love it that much. And I don't care if one, someone else doesn't love it. The thing I love about that, it's funny, I always joke to Rick that he'll say, you know, and I only did, I didn't prep for that. I'm like, if you don't count the 30 years of studying music, putting this guitar together, kind of, you got to use all your friends Yes. To put this guitar together. Yeah. So you guys, the guys at Glazer did the frets, right? Yeah. Or did Dan do the frets? Uh, Glazer's. Gla the guys yeah. at Glazer. I'm remembering yeah. this correctly. Yeah. The guys at Glazer's redid the frets. Uh, Ron Ellis rewound the bridge pickup. Yep. Yeah. Um, Dan uh, refinished the body in the end, yeah. right? And made it appropriate amount of wear, not yeah. relicking, but wear. Um, uh and the guys at Glazer cleaned the neck, or did you you had cleaned the neck? No, because you said the, the, the guitar was. I think the word used was nasty. When yeah, you got but it. I, I don't. I don't believe in cleaning the gunk off, <laughs> unless it's what unless are you, Mike it's like, Campbell. No, unless it's yeah. No, they they probably did a light cleaning. Okay. Yeah, okay. but nothing. Yeah, I don't like I don't like thick layers of funk on there. But I'm not really. Uh, people are always surprised when it's like I don't clean my guitars. I mean, I unless unless. Unless but you I do just, change the strings. Yeah, I do change the strings every every <laughs> gig or two. You know, just depending on you know, you know when they kind of lose their snap. But luckily, with like, I like the NYXLs, and I can get a couple of shows out of those. But uh, yeah, I'm not into polishing guitars at all. I mean, unless I unless I get stuff on it, like if I get some real nasty funk on there, I'm gonna sure, I'm sure. gonna get that off. But right. otherwise, it's like I'm not gonna clean the guitar. And and part of it is you know I, I kind of like older older instruments or. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got some questions here. Um, somebody says, "Didn't Kenny Vaughn play on some a bunch of studio sessions like Lana Del Rey?" Um, yeah, Kenny does studio work all the time. Kenny Vaughn's yeah. done a ton of studio work, and it's one of those things. I think it's very common, especially these days. There isn't a ton of studio work to go around anymore. People are doing a lot of recording. They're doing demos and things at home. When it there was a time when demo sessions were a big part of the business, um, but it and I think he talks about it in the interview where you'll get working with a particular producer and they know what they can get. And that, and that's the reason they're that the top guys are the top guys because they absolutely yeah. deliver. And Kenny's one of yep. the people that would deliver. So that's and, it. You know, what, what, because of the shift with recording technology, so many people are actually able to play their own parts because you know, it's just, you're using your own time. You're not paying for anyone else. And usually you're doing it from your home. And so some guy can sit there and he, then he can quantize it or move it around and as long as he can get close, it's fine. But then there, there comes a time where it's like, okay, I've got to hire, you know, someone else to be able to do these other things or when you actually right. have a budget. And so, yeah, so the, the, there are, there's much fewer, you know, sessions going on than, yeah. than there used to be. When, when I moved to Nashville in the early 90s, I was doing demo sessions and I was a student at Belmont. 
there was that much work to go around. It's no like, kidding. I, I got to play on songs that were cut. So I played on on demos that then ended up on the first Dixie Chicks album. And they actually played some of the parts that I had played on the demo. And that was like, and I was a student in school, but it's like nothing like that, you know, happens anymore right. because now it's like, you know, there's not the budgets to do uh, to do demos anymore because it, at, at that point it was like the songwriter had a, a budget from the publishing company and it was right. like, and, and there was an expectation of they wanted high quality demos to shop the songs around. Right. Now the attitude is like just a acoustic guitar and vocal is fine right. you know, most of the time. Or if you do anything else, it's out of your money. And, and most of the time, there's no money to be had if you pay a bunch of money for a, a, a well-produced demo. Right. Because on top of that, you would have had to build your YouTube following to just get the meeting in the first place. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> got some other questions here. That's completely true, actually. Um, this is a good question. Def Boshiers uh, says, did it take a lot of work to set up the deluxe on the HX Stomp patch um, that the two of us did together. So the, the, um, uh, this is from my first stomp preset pack, mm -hmm. which I really should rename like Keith's heroes, a la the HX stomp. Cause they're all my favorite guitar players. And, um, it was a time when, you know, Zach was preaching to me the merits of the deluxe. Um, and I was, I was doing a patch on the deluxe. Actually, there's a friend of, a uh, friend of both channels, Bill Sanderson, um, I had actually sent some drafts out to Bill, and Bill said, "You know, you should you should be doing a, a clean deluxe sound that people could use as a bass to then put pedals in front of and you know yeah. use as a bass." And so you don't have an HX stomp. No, it was it was literally me talking to you yeah. about about how you would dial a real amp to get the kinds of tones. And so um, yeah, your familiarity with deluxes let you consult right. on, on a sound building thing. And then I was changing it here. And then frankly, I was sharing it with people like Bill. And in the end, it, it, I think it turned out really well, but yeah. yeah. Doing the HX Stomp preset packs um, has been a lot of fun for me because I, I think I said this in the, in the video that I made about the HX Stomp. It, it could easily be a way to control your collecting of pedals and those kinds of things. Because if, you'd, if you've never owned a Univibe and you want to play with a Univibe sound, probably the Univibe model that's in there is going to have more tweak ability or like I just did a video about the Deluxe Memory Man. The Memory Man model in the HX Stomp has a lot more, you know, a tweak ability. Yeah. There's a lot more knobs, virtual knobs. Um, so you can d get in there. And uh, I just said this to Rick a few hours ago. Uh, he said a long time ago that all his friends were record producers, even if that's not how they made their living. Like everybody that was friends with him is fascinated with tone. Um, <laughs> when when Zach and I ever talk, it's a string of digressions that goes so many deep that we kind of, uh, as good friends, we try to keep coming back around. It's a challenge. It's 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 a yeah. wonderful challenge that we have enough things in common that we both like. Um, so I'm gonna digress. Yeah. Um, I I went to Carter Vintage yesterday and saw my buddy John Roncolato and Walter Carter and I've never been in that room, you know, but I've been doing the channel only a few years. But I said to Zach and, and his wife earlier, I said, I realized how much, how little I am kind of, I'm just not swooning around, you know, great old vintage guitars. Um, I'm fascinated by the stories and I am absolutely fascinated by the sounds that they were used to make. Um, like there was an, they have a, um, uh, a guitar that was played on Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde. And of course, Zach immediately says that was owned by Wayne Moss. <laughs> Yeah, and who uh, he he also played uh, he he kind of used he had a Strat and a Jazzmaster that he used so he, he used a Jazzmaster on uh, on Waylon Jennings Only Daddy Will Walk the Line and then he used this Strat on uh, on on the Dylan Blonde on Blonde album specifically there's a track called uh, I think it's uh, I Need You I think I think that's the 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 title and he's kind of playing this kind of finger picked electric part that's on that Strat and so yeah there's. I mean, it's a, where I'm going is that this guitar has been refinished and you can go to the Carter website and look at it. It's a 54, 56, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's a really old guitar. It is, it is the worst refin I've ever seen. And I'm not telling stories out of school. I think either Walter or John said that to me, yeah. but it's the provenance of the guitar that's, that's moving, yeah. you know, that's interesting to me. And I didn't get it out of the case. I have this thing where like the guys at Ish had a 1960 burst in 
and they're like, hey, we got the, the burst is here. Do you want to play it? No. No, no, don't put that in my lap. I, I don't I don't need to know, you know. I think it's really interesting, you know, playing, you know, vintage playing a lot of vintage guitars and playing a lot of artists, artist owned vintage guitars. And one of the things you find out so much is just that you want there to be an Excalibur. You want there to be right. all this magic in the instrument. And some of them, there is, you know, some magic. But so many times, it's just that you have this guy that got used to this guitar, and he really liked it, and he made a lot of good music on it. So, yeah. I mean, there's not that many instruments that, you know, even, you know, a lot of old guitars are just... And the reason I'm... You know, that Esquire was in terrible shape when I bought it. And it's like, but there was something about when I put my hand on that neck, there was there was something that was like really speaking to me. And I could, and I was willing to take the gamble on a guitar that <laughs> needed to have frets and, and, a, and a pickup rewind and a, and a refin and all these other things. Yeah. And it, so it ended up, but it might not have ended up that way. And it would, I wouldn't still own it. Yeah. And it wouldn't matter that it was a 57 Esquire. It's like, but as it is, it's like, I take that thing on gigs with me. I play it, you know, all over the place. And it's what I play 90% of the time because I love that guitar. Yeah. And it's like, and there's few, you know, I think the, the closest telly that, you know, would, would tempt me at all is Vince Gill's uh, Blackguard, his main <laughs> one. It's like, I've played it's, that one before. It's 53. <laughs> yeah, it's a 53. And that one had some, <laughs> that one had some magic on it, but I still can't tell how much of it was, was just me being kind of, and still, you know, Vince is one of my favorite tele players because he doesn't play a bunch of ridiculous. He doesn't play typewriter guitar, which to me, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm that. just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on my, uh, you know, you know, let me get the soapbox. I'm gonna get my soapbox and I'm gonna say I am so tired of the da 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 you know type of, and I don't care whether it's rock or bluegrass or, or electric country or whatever. It's like. I'm just burned out on that. And the thing about Vince Gill is even when he's playing a faster tune, everything he does has um, is melodic or sounds like a riff. It sounds like a phrase and, and he has a great tone. And so, uh, you know, so Vince has always been, you know, one of my, you know, favorite, you know, guys. And it's like, and he's, he's out there, he's very accessible and he's still, he's still singing and playing great. And it's like, you know, it's like, you know, that's one of the few acts that my wife and I can, you know, totally agree on. You know, she still thinks, you know, Vince Gill's dreamy. And, uh, and I guess that's I can, I can see I can see why you fell for it. Yeah. So yeah. one of the parts about that guitar, that two things about the, Vince's guitar that I love. One is like you, he plays it on gigs. If you go to like the old Crossroad festivals where Vince is playing, he's playing that 53. Yeah. He, he's got long shorts and a baggy, it was the one in Texas, a baggy yeah. shirt. He looks like a dad on vacation. Yeah. And he's playing that 53 telly and he's making it work on, uh, what's the Oklahoma? Oklahoma borderline. Yeah, borderline. Yeah. And the other thing about it is, I've heard him say multiple places that he's been looking for a backup yeah. for that guitar for what, 25, 30 years? Yeah, at least. And he's never found it. Yeah. Which, I, which it, you know, I, I tend to think that um, guitars... Uh, you, you hinted at this a minute ago. Guitars match with people. Yeah. Um, it could be that, you know, this guitar, I, although I will tell you that this guitar is very, very uh, dear to me already. This is yeah. this guitar. This is this is what I was trying to build when I built my parts caster telly. Yeah. Uh, it has just the perfect neck, has everything. Um, so it, I, I'm not real pulled away, but the fact is um, it's great when you find something that, that is, yeah. you know, it's, I said to Zach, it's like, be careful what you wish for because yeah. surely you'll get it. It, once you have it, if you know that's it, you, you know your journey now becomes back about the music. Yeah. So, see, there must have been about six digressions from each of us in there. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> Wait, I've got to say okay. hi to a couple of people. So Perry jumped on. Perry, we already talked about you, man. Yeah. So it's good that you came by. You're going to have to re yeah. re listen to that. So we said for some the horrible things. We did, about but Perry. we said oh, nice golly. things too. Uh, uh, David Gordon says coolest crossover since the love. <laughs> Love Boat went to Fantasy Island. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how insulted or privileged I feel about that. I, I just want to know who, you know, which characters we each get to be. I mean, because I mean, everyone... Well, I think they're hinting at how short I look, you know, compared to you. I, I think that's... I, I don't know. Welcome to Fantasy Island. You know, I can be Mr. <laughs> Roy. And, okay. yeah. So, uh, Sean Alaco actually asked a long time ago. So, before... Can you hold on to your story? Yes, okay. yes. All right. Uh, Sean says, how about an artist or band either of you think more people need to hear about? 
Well, you can't put that out on the universe without Perry jumping in. So look in the comments because Perry will be all over that. But go ahead. I would. Uh, I'm really awful about mainly listening to older artists, and uh, you know, sometimes people will joke with me that I only listen to dead people. And but I I recently on on a, a live stream from last month had some cats tell me about Sierra Farrell and uh, and I really in, enjoyed her. I mean, there there were stuff that was too kind of throwback to the '30s, kind of kitschy, but there was a lot of this kind of pure. Uh, you know, just kind of folk music aspect to her and, and her voice that I really enjoyed. And so that was, you know, one of the, the few uh, newer artists. I've, I've had a, a greater appreciation for, for Blake Mills. I think I was slow to come to, to, to listen to him just because I'm just wary of anyone that gets a lot of accolades, <laughs> which I know is terrible. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are, you know, good good young artists that are out there uh somebody i couldn't get back to the question but somebody asked earlier also uh why do we think that people um that younger people are listening to aren't listening to older great older music and um are listening to a lot of rap or whatever and i and i actually don't think that's true i i worked in higher education for 30 years and once the ipod came around and you know wireless headphones or even before that you know wired up headphones I would always stop my work study students and I said, what are you listening to? My favorite moments of, of doing that, because I did that exercise for a dozen years, at least, you know, after iPods came out, was when the students would answer in completely unexpected ways. And one of my favorite was this kid from New York who'd been working in my office for years and, you know, checkerboard vans and a, and a big tattoo of like grape leaves and grapes on her shoulder. And she's always wearing like muscle shirts and stuff. And I'm like, hey, Sabine, what, what are you listening to? And one day, and she goes, Frank Sinatra. And I'm like, oh, did your mom turn down? No, I turned my mom on to Frank Sinatra. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. I love it when they surprise you. Uh, people have heard me say this before. I do not carve out enough time to just sit and listen to music. Um, I get lots of recommendations. When I send a script to Perry, and he sends, he sends it back with his uh, changes, additions, recommendations, um, he always includes music to edit to, which is kind of a joke because I really can't have music on when I'm trying to write yeah. or even edit. I can't either. Yeah, I can't. It takes a piece of my brain that I'm hopefully using to write the script. Um, uh, and he's, he's learned over time. For a long time, it was a little, a little bit of a joke because his tastes run into the dark metal world sometimes. He's like, how about this? No, yeah. it was a big joke. So I wish I could tell you uh, an artist. I, I probably would be... Like yourselves and uh, like yourself, and I, I, I probably listen to a lot of old music. So, yeah. yeah, my uh, my children, of course, they they get force fed um, a lot of old music from me, but they they listen to a lot of uh, you know contemporary music, and and that kind of you know, I get to hear a lot of more contemporary pop music, and some of it I can really you know enjoy and understand why it's popular, and there are things where I've just you know. You know, old man, get off my lawn. You know, I don't understand this. <laughs> Rick, so, Rick's thing is old man shouting at clouds. Exactly. Old man shouting. Exactly. <laughs> Why <are> you? <laughs> you know. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Tim Lurch is on the stream, ladies and gentlemen. Oh says, my goodness. Two of my favorite dudes right there together on my screen. If you haven't seen it, I, I've been talking to everybody about this lately. Tim did a video recently about um, levels of playing. And I, I think I must have listened to it three times now, and I will listen to it again when I need this reminder. And Tim, basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to generalize, but you should all go listen to it. It's about a 10-minute video. He's talking about how the industry keeps telling us that we need, you'll be good if you just buy this course and get to the next level. And Tim's message is, are you making music now? Did you not get into this to make music? Enjoy the fact that you're making music now and realize that, yes, when you learn that Bonamassa lick or uh, Burton lick, that... You might feel good, but it's fleeting. And unless you incorporate it into real music, then that's really not the reason you're trying to learn it. Well, I think you're, you're and you, you just hit on an important point. And I think, Tim, one, I want to say hi to Tim, who, you know, that's one of my favorite lounges because I was just such a fan of, of Tim Lurch. And so honored that you would uh, come say hello. Uh, yeah, I think so much... I think your guitar playing and you just as a musician, you get better when you focus on songs. And I think one of the best things that's happened to me in the last couple of years was uh, 
playing with a guy that insisted that I sing. And that's not <laughs> something that I, like in the past, like especially like when I was playing heavily and like really touring a lot, I never sang. Really? Never. And so I just, I didn't like, because I just wanted to focus on the guitar. And I would, you know, kind of like, I would just be staring at the guitar the whole time and just kind of like not interacting with people. And, uh -huh. and it was... And it was only like in the last decade that because of, uh, of my friend Paul Bogart that I, you know, play shows with, you know, off and on through the years, uh, you know, he said, you know, I need a break and I need you to sing some songs and also need to be able to sing some harmonies and such. And so it was like, and so then I had to learn more about this instrument and I had to learn, all of a sudden I had to learn songs and you had to think about, okay, I need to learn a song that I can do the intro and then I, I have to learn, oh, I've got to do the intro and, and then I've got to come in with my voice and, and then I've got to, oh, I've got to go straight from singing to playing a solo and then coming back in. I'm, all these things that I'd never thought about because it was like I was always just the guitar player. But I think when you focus on music and being musical and songs, when you think about songs and learning songs and, 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 and kind of enlarging your repertoire, and whatever style of music you're into, or whatever it is, but it's like learn songs. Yeah. Learn the chords. Learn the melody. Learn you know. Learn all these different things. And I think that's one of the one of the best things you can do. And I like the fact that, like c coming back around to Tim, and Tim has you know lessons that are based on songs too, where he's taking a song and and really showing you how to play, whether it's chord melody yeah. or, or what have you. Yeah. So. It, it's you know I've I've never taught guitar. Uh, for a living, God knows. But when people say, I want to start playing guitar, I'm like, you should, absolutely should. What, what should I do? I'm like, okay, well, yeah, what, gotta, yeah, gotta have a guitar. I do that whole talk. And the next thing I say is, you gotta decide what kind of music you want to learn to play guitar to play. Yeah. And then I say, well, can you sing? Oh, no, I can't sing. Well, okay, you need to start singing. Well, why? Yeah. I said, because if you're singing the song, it will force you to change chords in the right place. It will force you to do it quickly. Because you'll hear that it's time to change chords. Well, hopefully you right. will. And you'll hear that. And and you realize, especially like with the kind of noodling I was just doing a minute ago with the chords, it's like, yeah, you can go, oh, faux ostinato. I'm, I'm building drama. No, I'm getting my fingers together to play the next weird chord voicing. If you're playing a song, there's none of that. Right. Yeah, you know, like yeah, the band is moving on, and yeah, there's yeah, yeah. there's rhythm. <laughs> yeah, it, things there's, things there's move, things are moving forward. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I think that the one of the best things you can do is uh, is is focus on songs and singing yeah. just makes a huge difference. And and thinking about melodies and uh, and thinking about you know because again I'm going to mention Vince again just because you know it's like when he stops singing his guitar start starts singing and same way with like bb king bb king wouldn't even play hardly you know when he was when he was singing and uh and so that that whole thing where it's like you stop singing and then the guitar takes over and uh yeah, yeah. And yeah. so that's that's what i try to think about steve moore says uh with so many stores going online how do you play enough guitars to find the one that's right for you this is the whole online guitar world thing. Yeah, um, it, it's it's that's pretty simple. Um, you you won't be able to if you can't play it. You're 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 rolling dice all the time. Yeah, you certainly can buy guitars at a price point where you know you're going to be able to roll back out of it. And you're fine. So even if there was a cost in you know maybe you lose the shipping, uh, I I write that down as a educational cost to when I'm playing playing guitars. Jeff and I always joke. People are like, wow, you have really nice guitars. I'm like, yeah, I'm 60 years old. You know, uh, yeah. if I'm not going to have these guitars now, when am I going to have them? Or like in your case, you're like, yeah, that's my forever guitar. That's the guitar I'm going to play. That's amazing. Yeah. But it took you a while to find that. And like you said, you know, if you saw it until you touched that neck, you wouldn't know. And yeah. you touched a lot of guitars to be able to know. Right. Um, so. It takes a long time to figure out what you like and what works for you. And I think the, the best thing, you know, if you are buying guitars online, you know, just, yeah, be willing to, to just say, okay, what kind of, I need an approval period and okay, maybe I'm going to have to pay the shipping back, but it's worth it because I mean, I'd much rather pay, 
even I know it, you know it, it would get expensive after a while, but you know shipping on a guitar is probably going to be in the fifty dollar range, maybe to a hundred, I guess at some points. Well, now man, yeah. shipping has gotten really expensive. Yeah. yeah. Well, then maybe you need to get on the old Craigslist and 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 Facebook Marketplace and wherever else you can and and try to find as many different things and uh, you know of course that's always dicey. I always enjoyed the Craigslist, you know, going to some stranger's house. I'd always. <laughs> I would, you know, of course here I, I have, you know, true tone offices. And so whenever I was doing Craigslist deals over the last 15 years, I've been working for true tone. I would, uh, I would always try to get people and, and I'd even, you know, even if there had to be like some money involved, I said, Hey, I need you to come down to the offices yeah. because that way, you know, we, it could, could be, be plugged in. There was safety. Right. There was other people yeah. there. So I didn't feel yeah. like I, you know, someone was going right. to, you know, Pull a Smith and Wesson. Yeah, and, and, and for me, um, set, when I sell guitars, I often still sell through stores, um, even even if I'm going to lose a percentage because it's a sort of an insurance thing. I, I have enough guitars and video gear and stuff at the house to do the channel at the level I do it now. Everybody saw the studio tour. Uh, okay, everybody, everybody didn't see it. That video didn't do that well. But but if you saw the video tour, you'd see that it's like, this is more stuff than I want somebody to look at. You know, yeah. grapes in it. You know, before I forget... I, I mentioned that I recently got invited to a local song circle and they were almost apologetic about the sort of three chord songs that I was going to end up encountering there. Uh, if you're familiar with this idea of a song circle, there's about seven or eight of us sitting in a circle. Everybody's got an instrument on their lap. There's a banjo player. There's a, the ban banjo player. Everybody's looking at each other to see what the chords are, except the banjo player was blind. He was the only person that really never missed any chords. He yeah. was an amazing player. Anyway, the idea is you go around and people people call a song and then the song that you call you're expected to sing so these are all people i've never met before i have no reason to be shy around these folks they don't know i, I imagine they're going to find out what the, my opinion their opinion is of my singing in a minute yeah. but I, like i went through the whole first night and then i went home and i started shedding tunes that i you know grew up playing on acoustic guitar and stuff that i used to sing with my family yeah um, because because there's there's no substitute for doing that, for like learning songs and working on repertoire. And, you know, we were talking about artists. I went back recently and started listening to a lot of William Prince. Just amazing, beautiful, yeah. beautiful songwriting. Uh, we had a couple, of, we had a top chat. Nice. Um, yeah. People saying hi to Tim as they should. You know, if you, if you do top chat and stuff like that, you're paying for our lunch. So, <laughs> and know that we are going to have a brick with your name on it. That's going to, no, I, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to tell you. Um, can I tell a stupid story real quick? I don't know. Is it about me? No, it's not about oh, you. Oh, then help yourself. Okay. <laughs> so I, I grew up in a, uh, you know, in a very conservative, you know, family and went to a, a Pentecostal church, uh, Assembly of God Church. And it was, it was great, but there were, there were some interesting things that would happen at times. And at one point they had the Blackwood Brothers, who was a famous gospel, you know, singing quartet that came in and sang at our church. And they, they had kind of honed their, uh, their fundraising to a certain degree where they were, you know, they, they knew how to push people's buttons to get them to give, to get them to pull out their wallets. Like you just did with the lunch thing. Yeah, like I just did that with was the, the lunch segue. thing. That was the segue. So it was subtle, but it was, uh, <laughs> yes, if you don't pay, we will, this man, look how skinny he is. He will not be able to eat lunch if you don't. Okay, so here was what happened. So they're, they're up there and they've been singing their, their you know, their songs with, you know, four-part harmony and, and, you know, boom, 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 you know. The guy and then and they always do the octave drop where the uh, the the bass singer will do will start off and go, and then he'll go down into the basement. There was all that kind of stuff going on. Then they stop and they start their sob story where it's like, you know, we have this bus and you know we haven't been able to make the payments on it, and uh, we really need your help. And if we're not able to pay off the bus, it's gonna go. And a dramatic pause here to Alice Cooper. And then I thought, it was just, it was insane. And, the, and he said, and if you give at the thousand dollar level, we will put a brass plaque in our bus as we go in the door so that we will remember to pray for you each and every time we go in and out of it. There you go. Yeah. 
Is it too late to get in on that? I could use a little of that. <laughs> you probably, I could use I a little bit. Could. I, I could. Think I could. I could probably. I could probably still get in on it. Yeah, is you, what you're saying, you, right? You could. Yeah. yeah just contact yeah. the Blackwood Brothers <laughs> at www. That uh, could go to alicecooper.com, <laughs> or, or just go to Alice Cooper and give him the money. There you go. Whichever you know. Yeah, that's that's a great story. Cody Hudman wants to know. Top chat. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank uh, you, Cody. Going towards lunch. Lunch. My two favorite YouTubers together. Are we running out of time? What are you doing? No, I was, I was just, I was just gonna real quick. I'm sorry to interrupt. Cody uh, sent me a speaker, and so I'm, uh, I'm. I was coming in, to that. in the process. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, yeah. How can you know? Yeah. Uh, on my two possible, on my two possibly, let's see. Uh, oh, my two favorite YouTubers together. On my two possibly buy, I might buy a 1962 blonde basement with two by twelve tone rings. Curious on both your thoughts on blonde brown era amps. Hope you like that speaker, Zach. Cheers. That, well, thank you, Cody. Thank you so very much. So what's the speaker? Much. The speaker is a uh, Eminence Alessandro ceramic 40-watt uh, speaker. Wow. So it's it's the, uh, you know, it's I think it's called SC64. In the background, we're hearing my little uh, cockapoo that is uh, is whimpering because she's dreaming that she is uh, chasing, currently yeah, chasing squirrels in chasing the sky. Chasing squirrels in the sky. She loves to chase squirrels. So this is a, a speaker that uh, JD, you know, of course, JD Simo is a good friend of mine and has <laughs> influenced me a lot. And uh, of course, that's why I got a deluxe reverb with a, and put a vintage 30 in it. Well, then now he has a deluxe reverb that he's got this Alessandro speaker. And so I oh. mentioned it in a live stream oh. that I wanted to check it out. And Cody was kind enough to uh, to send send it as, as a gift. And so thank that's you. That's like when I was making the Blackguard yeah. video and I mentioned it on a live stream and the guy from Hollywood sent me the nacho caster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he didn't give it to you. Oh, he gave you the speaker? Yeah, he gave me the speaker. Wow. Yeah, see, Co Cody is, is high. And he, Co and Cody, we need to talk more. Yeah. <laughs> this is a Thank relationship you, we should work on. Yes. Um, Adam Ryan says, I love how Keith looks like Nashville country, but Zach looks like Bakersfield. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I think it's funny. Guitars, Cadillacs. Yeah. There you go. Hillbilly music. <laughs> see, you got him singing now. Yeah. The dude says hello from Japan. Hello, dude. Uh, let's see. It's always good to see folks kind of chatting with each other. Steve the Rule, hi from Rochester. Yeah, I left you behind there, Steve. I went right by you coming out here because I went to Columbus and then down. Bakersfield. You're in Nashville and I'm Bakersfield. Yeah, I, I don't know what part of me looks like Nashville. I don't know. I, got I mean, this. I could ham up the accent, but yeah. yeah. Although the accent in this room is by way of Texas. Yeah. Your accent, definitely Texas, right? Yeah. Right. Born and raised. You know, you can you can never you know, I've tried, but you can't you can't get rid of the Texan. You know, it just it stays with you and Cup of Noodles, hey man, uh, wants to know is a Gibson three thirty full hollow an okay acoustic substitute for singer songwriter stuff. You know, it's interesting. I've seen I've seen some people opening for other folks that are playing uh, hollow body electrics. And I think it works fine yeah. in, in a singer songwriter situation. Yeah. And sorry, I don't want to interrupt, no. but I, I, we didn't answer. Cody oh. had asked about blonde and brown. Oh, and right. We didn't. We didn't. We, we didn't. We and, and joking so around. We, we need to. Uh, we need to come back around yeah, to yeah. that. So the blonde and brown Fender amps are some of the beefiest sounding but clearest sounding amps that Fender made. And it's kind of a, an oversimplification to say, well, it was kind of like halfway between the blackface and the tweed. But those amps were, they were really starting to get stout, especially the basemen, you know, amp that, that you're talking about. You know, a, a, a 62, you know, blonde basemen has a lot of power behind it and it has a lot of, it's able to produce a lot of low end. It's got a big enough transformer to produce that. It's also got a lot of mid range. And so they, they you know, those the brown amps just really tended to have more mid range than than the blackface amps, and, and it always seemed to me like uh, Leo was not around as much. They're just not as clean. Yeah, they they break up sooner, right? They, it's that yeah. it's the mid. The mids are it's, pushing the gain faster. It's the mids, and it's also the the speakers because the speakers, what, the weak point on Fender amps, is the speakers. Mm. And it always was because Leo went as cheap as possible on the speaker. And so he would always, you know, for a 20-watt amp, it got a 20-watt speaker. <laughs> and so 
what happens is, is that so many guys, once you get these old amps, and now sometimes the original speaker can be golden in it and work great. Right. But I've just seen so many times where the original speaker does not work well. I've seen, you know, like in a Tweed, you probably want to have the original, you know, blue back, you know, Jensen. But like in a lot of the brown amps and in a lot of the black face amps, I think they really benefit from a, a new speaker. And then it just depends on what direction you want to go. If you want to go British or American type. Right. But those brown amps, especially when you put it through, you know, a, a more modern speaker or something that has more efficiency, it's like you're really able to appreciate all that that amp can do. And I think they're they're really, really great amps. And they were only made for a couple of years. I mean, you basically have, you know, 60 to, you know, 63 where they were really being produced in, in numbers. And, and they're, they're just great amps. And there's, a, there's quite a bit of evolution between 60 to 63 as well, right? Yeah. So the, it's great that you asked the question very specifically, but probably even within 62, there was a lot of evolution on yeah. those. And the, and the basement, just in the, in the next year or so, it changes where it loses its presence knob and it gets the bright switch. And, it, and it's basically the black face version and it doesn't have as much mid-range to it. So, I mean, that's a different amp. It doesn't sound the same. So the... By the, late 62 or by 63? By 63. By 63. In 63, yeah. yeah. Uh, by March 30, no, I'm sorry, that's a <laughs> no, no, they joke. pulled from the parts bin too yeah. much to be <laughs> yeah, able to exactly. do that, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I hope uh, we answered your, your question, Cody, and thank yeah. you so much for uh, no, I, uh, thanks for bringing us back. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've always I've always liked uh, all that mids, I think that's where guitars live. My frustration with amps from that period, although kind of with amps in general, and it's the reason my little pedal boards will always you're gonna end up seeing me using a rocket Mark Lettieri as my boost. Um, slash gain, and I use it very differently all the time, is it's got a very effective six-band, very guitar-oriented six-band EQ on it. Yeah. And any any kind of frustrations I have with missing a mid-control and those kinds of things, especially with amps in that era, um, boy, having a six-band on your board is just, it's just gold. It's absolute gold. Yeah, or, you know, the other thing is just a, you know, a cheap Boss EQ pedal. And then if you want to pay... Oh, sorry, for yeah. EQ, that's what I was yeah. saying, really. I was yeah. trying to say that. Yeah, But, I mean, you know, that's, that's a great pedal. But, I mean, you can get used, you know, Boss EQ pedals all day long for, you know, $100 or less. Right. And it's just such a great tool. And, uh, you know, you can get those modified. And that's, you know, and they right. can make them a little bit less noisy. And so it just depends on whether More it's... More guitar friendly. Whether, yeah. Whether yeah. It's, yeah. And so I, I have a, a couple of Boss EQ pedals, some that have been modified, some that haven't, because some, sometimes I, I need to have the full frequency range. But the thing is, is that, that it's such a fixer. Having an EQ pedal is such a fixer for any amp. So it's like if you're ever showing up for a gig and, you, and, you, and the back line is being provided, have an EQ pedal. Because then it's like, let's say you get a reissued deluxe reverb with the Jensen C12K, which I hate hate how you I feel about hate, it i hate that speaker <laughs> and so because it didn't have mids and so i put a vintage 30 in my deluxe reverb because i want more mids out of the amp right. and so but with the eq pedal it's like you can just fix that and i was like i remember in an interview another one of my heroes reggie young he said that uh some you know the interviewer asked him about like boutique pedals and he said i don't understand all that stuff he said you know, and, and I'm not imitating his voice by any means, but uh, he said something to the effect that uh, his favorite pedal was the Boss EQ pedal because he said, I can get any sound I want with that. Yeah, there's a moment in the um, rig rundown that John Bollinger did with Tom Bukovac where Buk, he's got this massive studio pedal board and then he's talking about his EQ pedal and um, he leans over and he goes, for example, he's got a 335 in his lap and he leans over and he says, and he moves some things around and he goes, here, automatic Gretsch. And he starts playing and he, of course it's Tom, so he makes it sound like a Gretsch too. Yeah, and you, here are, uh, so this is just a regular old Boss one. And you can see I've got the bass cut on it. And this is what I use for my baritone or six string bass guitar to run it through a guitar amp and play with a bass player. These are your settings? Yeah, those People are the are settings. People are screenshotting. Yeah, right so now. if they want, if they, if they care. So, and so that way I can run both a regular guitar and a six string bass through the same amp and also not compete with the bass player. And so I just cut down you know, the bass there and then it works fine. So that's how I use this one. And I change this out depending on what I'm taking on the gig. Now, otherwise, this is one of Exact Tone Solutions 
you know, that's modified, it doesn't have as much low end. So it only goes down, you know, to 400. And so then I use it as, of course, a mid-range boost and I, and I have a little bit of the, the gain up. And so that's, you know, that's your, uh, your, you your lead, you know, sound. So just a little more mids and a little louder. Cesar Augusto Rodriguez wants to know, thank you both for your great content. Is there a head similar to the Chris Stapleton Brown amp? Simple single channel few knobs. I don't I don't know of one, but I'm sure there's a million uh, deluxe uh, boutique builders out there that would put one together for you. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't even know what's the price point on the Stapleton. Uh, I, I know it was around two grand, you know, before uh, before the they? price hike. So oh. I think I think they're, yeah. they're they're more than that at the, at this point. So in, in that price point, you could have. Um, Basically, the Stapleton version, the Brown Princeton, built by any number of people, like you know Dan Lurie, my buddy in Vermont, would do an amp with that, and minimal knobs or give you the full you know EQ stack. You yeah, because the Brown Princeton is just a single channel, you know, anyway. I mean, it just has you right, know, it has, you know, it just has volume, tone, and speed and intensity. I think that's part of the draw here. Yeah, and thanks for the the top chat, Cesar. Really yeah. appreciate it. And it's and it, it's a it's a really cool amp. You know, I you know, of course, you are paying for the fact that you're you're paying for the Fender name. That's just kind of you know part of the deal. So yes, you could probably get a builder to do a a, a head version of that, or you know, uh, for for cheaper than what a Stapleton would cost. Yeah. So uh, Dennis McKeon says he hopes this pairing is a regular thing. It's lovely, uh, Dennis. I know Dennis is in England. Uh, the the re the reality is, this is the first time we've ever been in the room together, and I live uh, I don't know nine hundred miles that way. Yeah. But we've actually I, I I haven't been on your live stream. Yeah. Um. But you've been on mine. Yeah. Because see, here's the difference between Keith and I. <laughs> Keith understands technology. I'm. I'm like uh, unfrozen caveman lawyer. You're you're, yes. you're actually my living example of. When people say, oh, I could never do YouTube, I'm like, uh, my friend Zach has a channel with 30, how many subs now? Uh, I think it's around 35,000. 35,000 yeah. subscribers. We're doing this on an iPhone yeah. and with a lav mic on a mic stand between the two of us. And we did test the audio at the beginning. It's it's completely usable. None of that. It's great. Yeah. I mean, and then the, the how far you can go with your phone, especially the new phones, it's just amazing. Yeah, uh, there's no reason not to do it. And and so yeah, so my barrier to entry as far as the YouTube thing, the having a channel, was technology. And when I found that I could use my phone and I could use my my you know understanding, I mean, the joke in the office, like Bob Wild, the owner of True Tone, he always jokes if it has more than two knobs, Zach's not going to use it. <laughs> and, and that's a joke because I do use amps that have more knobs than that at times, but. It's like I like things really simple and I don't really, uh, you know, and so I get a little bit confused when you, and so because of that, because of the, the limited uh, technology, uh, you know, things, things that I ha own and, and know how to use, I don't, I haven't had a, a guest on the live stream, but, uh, I, but I'm, you know, and yeah, that's why we're doing I, it. Well, right. And, now. and people have heard me say this before. My job before I retired early in my late fifties um, was doing, um, big software projects. I was a university registrar at the University of Vermont for the last 15 years of my career. And so I was teaching people technology all the time. So when it came time to learn the levels of technology for a YouTube channel, that was that was like just like going back to the office. So that was nothing to yeah. it. Um, Antoon Hermans from uh, Holland. Um, Antoon, I just started working on my Dutch again. I, I'm on vacation, so I'm working on my French and my Dutch Rosetta Stone in my room. Wow. Um, ik on Netherlands. Just a little bit of Dutch I speak, just a little bit. Um, so how do you, what do you guys think about the Jupiter speaker, which are really hot these days? Um, I, I don't know what he's talking about. The Jupiter speakers, I'm, I'm thinking they are made by WGS. Oh, okay. For Jupiter to their spec. So it's, it's a, you know, uh, kind of an OEM type thing. And, uh, well, it's just made to their, their specifications. And so it's a tweaked out Jensen type speaker. And so a friend of mine that has a blonde basement, he just got a blonde basement and uh, I believe it's a 61 or 62. And he bought a pair of the Jupiter 12 inch speakers and he put them in the amp and he's just, you know, 
happy as a lark, whatever that means. Are, are larks happy? I think they sound it. They sound happy. They sound it, yeah. yeah. So he's very happy. Which, as we all know, is really the whole point. Yeah. You know? So uh, Deja Voodoo says, who needs John Mayer's Klon settings when you have Zaxi Q settings? That's, that's I couldn't have said that better, Deja. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Deja. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Dennis Key McKeon says, um, Telly into a J-Rocket Blue Note, into a J-Rocket Boing, into a uh, Pro Junior Tweed, really. Um, yeah, those are all great components. Yeah, that's, totally a, that's a great rig. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Chris Vincent says, Christopher Vincent says, can you imitate a brown amp with a black face through an EQ? Yes. Yeah, and so by, by boosting the mids, it's not going to get the exact same character, but it's going to get you a lot closer. So, uh, uh, And you can you could turn that upside down, too. You could you could scoop the mids and uh, and take your brown towards the black face world as well right. with and an it, EQ. Yeah, there's always going to be some difference, but you can certainly get closer <laughs> to that. Alan Mitchell says, I don't know if I've ever heard Keith play guitar. Uh, I played a little bit of guitar earlier yeah. in the program. You can plug the Esquire back in. I'll play something else. I only play guitar when I'm in Nashville. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I was going to play some more, and then Zach turned the volume down. I think he's like, it's a, a good defensive mechanism here. Here, I'll trade you. Oh, here, I, I get to hold the, the phone. Right, now you're in charge of Let's the see, questions. John, John Pinella. Let's see. What are those ceramic 10-inch speakers J.D. Simon is into at the moment? I don't know, Deja. I know that he's using the uh, the Eminence Alessandro speaker in his in his deluxe. So I'm not. Uh... Well, you got me unplugged there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. You're worse. You're used to working a solo here. I might have the tone controls right now. So yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Great to see the two of you, John Pinella says. Hello, John. John has a wonderful channel. Let's uh, let's get these two to jam together. Come on, everybody. <laughs> yeah, let's start dragging out stuff. We yeah. haven't been on long enough today yet. And John Pinellas is my 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 two favorite YouTubers. Thank you, John. Thanks, sir. Let's see. Oh my goodness, we got, we got more and more comments. I think uh, people are finding out that we're online here. This is wonderful surprise to see the uh, two great people on together. I watch both of your channels. Thank you. That was Music Studios Exec. Danik, do either of you have opinion on orange amps? Uh, to me, orange amps were uh, always a little more brown, fendery, marshally kind of things that were kind of a little bit more of a rock amp. So I kind of, I kind of steered away from them because I'm more Bakersfield. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I don't think you get a lot of orange here in Nashville. No, you don't. No, I actually, you know, um, I actually have a couple of books about orange amps. And the, uh, to be perfectly blunt, the amp ex episodes take a long time to build views. So they're, they're sort of labors of love when I do make, and I do plan to make an orange amps episode. I just haven't done it yet. So this is more John, John Cordy stuff. Uh, John did an amazing rendition of um, When She Loves, When She Loved Me yeah. from Toy Story 2. Yeah. Um, and I've been trying on vacation. I've been picking out the um, the chords uh, to it. So, and this is like one of those examples of you would typically play this. He plays almost everything on the neck on his Strat, um, but I I find that playing it on this sounds perfectly good. If I can remember where I am. Feels a little warbly. Well, that's because the verb has a little bit of warble on it. Really? Yeah. So the reverb on the amp has a little warble on it. I've never noticed that. Yeah. Huh. When you turn it up higher, you can hear hear it more. I've never. I guess I didn't play mine yeah. enough. Yeah. See, I missed the twelve-inch speaker. Yeah. When we're doing this. Well, yeah. with, with just the bridge pickup. Yeah. I, trying yeah. to get it to do this, the yeah, big this bigger thing, thing right? Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I, have, you know, I have a bunch of other amps here, but uh, you know, I, I tend to use the, the little VibraChamp you know, for uh, I'm going to do for a, Brian, for live streams. a Brian Sutton trick 
and switch to my blue note, uh, blue, blue chip, chip pick because, and you'll hear the big difference here. It is fatter sounding. Yeah. Mm, what is it? Oh. What? We They've just said we've had a, a lot of comments. They said, uh, has Keith ever tried to play the Ask Zach theme? <laughs> <laughs> that you know, no see, pressure there. Yeah, right. And and that would have been the smart thing to do. See, professionals would have done that. So that's pretty funny. Yeah. And we had uh, there were some other good ones. Uh, did your buddy get the Al Nico or ceramic for the blonde basement? He got the ceramic. Uh, oh my goodness. Twelve foot chain. Hello. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Princeton sixty five versus the hand wired sixty four? The hand wired is better. Uh, I don't love that they put a P10R in there. I would swap the speaker out for something else, probably a ceramic uh, Celestian, but that's that's my thing. But the hand-wired is, a, is, I enjoyed it more than the 65. Someone cut off parts of your telly. <laughs> I get that a lot. I get that a lot. I've gotten uh, uh, Klingon telly. Yeah, Kling, That was one of my favorites. Klingon telly. Klingon yes. telly. Actually, I have to confess that the... The fact that it's a warped, you know, traditional shape. I, um, I've talked to Ola about it, Ola Strandberg, and I think that he enjoys that part too. I will tell you that everything about this shape, where well, you see me holding it like this, this is all about, I mean, I played classical guitar in college because they made me. Um, but there's everything about the shape is for this. It's the ergonomics of it. Right. It works in all these different ways. Um, and I've had people say, wow, that's cool. And that's kind of how I feel about it. And then I get people that are just, man, that sounds good, but it's so ugly. But um. I like it. The, the problem for me, again, you know, because people alluded to the fact that I'm bigger than Keith, is that anytime I play anything smaller than a Telecaster, so even when I play a Les Paul, it starts to look like a mandolin on me. And I play mandolin, but it's like, and then people go, oh, look at the big guy with the little guitar. <laughs> I get that. Why'd comment. you go on Minnesota when you said that? Look at the guy with the big guitar. <laughs> Look at the guy eh? with the big guitar. I don't know. It just, you know, I, I can't control these things. They just kind of happen. Oh, let's see. Is it worthwhile to replace the Jensen C12Q speaker for an Alessandro in my 64 Deluxe Reissue handwire? It Well, here's always the thing. If you like the sound of it, don't mess with it. Right. Uh, and, and then it's like, okay, if you want to change something, what do you want to change? Are you wanting it to be louder, which means you need a more efficient speaker? Are you wanting it to have more bass? If you want it to have, do you want it to have smoother trebles? Well, then you probably need to get something that has maybe a felt dome on it or something, something like that. So always when people ask me, hey, should I swap out this speaker? It's like, well, what are you going for? Yeah. It's like on a deluxe reverb, I want to hear a vintage 30. Why? Because it smooths the highs and it tightens up the, the low end. And so that's what falls apart on a deluxe reverb is the low end. When I'm playing a Telecaster on the bridge pickup and I start doing some Pete Anderson or Vince Gill type low string things, I want it to hold together. Well, a, a C12Q won't hold together. But a Vintage 30, because it's a 60 watt speaker and it's also real firm in the bass, it will hold together and I can play those things without it just, you know, sounding like mush. Yeah. So you, yeah, you, you have to think about what's your application. Both of you are inspiring hosts, says uh, Jose <laughs> Sal, uh, Salvador. Uh, that's very kind. And sickness enablers. Absolutely. Well, actually, one of the things I was going to say when we were talking about the speaker um, pile, I, I went through a period of time where I was building amplifiers for fun. And I never would have told you that I was sort of a ship in a bottle, you know, mental project therapy guy but I really found that very satisfying because at the end it was an amp that I probably wouldn't have spent the money on and I I built champs I built five watt overdrive specials I built the five watt silver jubilee uh, I built um, a matchless lightning I built over a dozen amps but one of the things that made that fun and possible was that I had Dan Lurie who was became uh, like one of my best friends and because he was an amp builder, he had all these amazing parts yeah. at his place. And o over time, I ended up having a pile of speakers too. And I will tell you that having having one friend that regularly has fallen off the wagon and filled his closets with stuff that you can borrow and try is an incredible yeah. resource. It, it is. You, we should all be... Now, these people are being nurtured by every person, every gearhead out there, probably. But, yeah. um, boy, having a friend who's who's interested and, in, like, doesn't bother selling the stuff off immediately. I'm not that guy anymore, but there was a time when I was that guy. 
if you wanted to try a different speaker, I probably had one. Yeah, that's that's one thing that, that's been helpful for me is is you know, of course, living in Nashville, it's like it's not such a difficult thing <clears throat> sometimes to to hear a different speaker or go to someone else's house. Uh, so a couple of comments here. One, I need to say hi to, to Sean McGee, who is, uh, you know, uh, a, a wonderful person that I've gotten to, to know more recently. Uh, also, Otto, Otto says, tell Keith he's going to hear from me for saying Esquire and pulling out that thing. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Otto von Flaumaus in, yes. in Rome. And Sean McGee also says, I'm sorry, fellas, that guitar hurts my brain. I've had that a lot. <laughs> That's just because I'm playing it, Sean. Oh, Uncle Left Uncle Left Eyes is making fun of me. He says, please tell me that those stools are not the same height. They are the same height. <laughs> I just slouch. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and I, you know, yeah, I can't help it. Yeah. All right. Let's well, you're 6'2". I'm 6'2". Yeah. yeah. And I'm 5'9 and three quarters. Yeah. You know, so Sean says, uh, have you tried a V30 or, or an EV in the Tone Master? Not yet. I, uh, oh, I have. I, think, I mean, I think the V30 probably make it even better. Well, the, the speaker that's in there is a Neo Cream back. It's a Neo It's cream not a million back. miles away. Yeah. yeah. It's the problem with the, the Neo Cream back is that it is lower efficiency than the Vintage 30. And so, when, because I was doing some, some, huh. where I was plugging my old deluxe reverb into hmm. the Tone Master cabinet to hear the Oh, because you've been doing speaker testing, yeah. right? So I wanted to hear the, the Neo with my old amp. Well, it's a lot less. The volume went down by about, you know, 10%, which, yeah. you know, and was like, what? And I had to, so I had to, you know, change the volume setting, which kind of changes the tone. So it was kind of hard to do a really fair comparison. Uh, and, it's yeah. interesting. I was doing some consulting with a, a company that I really like. I can't talk about the project except to say that I was really pushing them towards the, um, they're talking about a combo and they're I was pushing them towards the Neo Creamback. And they said they tested it, but because it was less efficient, they just couldn't, the difference in weight between that and a regular Creamback, they're like, it, it's just no contest. It was no contest. It's a huge. So I'm like, difference. get an EQ pedal. Yeah. <laughs> just boost boost deal with it more. man deal, yeah. deal with it if you need a little more gas yeah it's a little a little more is a little more there's no way around that so, yes yeah yeah so uh are we out of questions are we done we've been here a long time yeah we've been here a long time yeah and i think i think we need to we need to, there have been some calls for us to play together but you know the thing is it's it's past my lunchtime as you can tell i'm a regular eater <laughs> And uh, and we need, we need to go find some food and maybe we'll maybe we'll get some sushi or some Thai food. We're yeah, just that's a, both things sound what, great. What keep, but thank you so much for all of the uh, the people that have uh, put put some money in the old uh, in the top chat. Yeah, top thanks chat. for lunch. Yes, thank Re you for lunch. Really appreciate it. Yes, yeah. we we are going to enjoy it and we're going to you know think about you and we are going to put a brass plaque. On I don't know what we're gonna put on the on plate. the Blackwood Brothers bus. That's right. Then <laughs> so that they will pray for you each and every time they get on and off the bus. And they, in the name of Alice Cooper. In the name of Alice <laughs> we're gonna, Cooper. We're gonna donate the money in the name <laughs> of, of Alice. Alice Cooper. So that his name will be on there, and they'll have to pray for him. That's a, that's a good story. All right, guys. Well, right. you know, honored that all y'all came out. You know, honored that uh, that Keith is here. We're gonna go enjoy My some pleasure. lunch. I hope y'all have a, a great rest of the day. Yeah, we'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Take care.